<laughs> good afternoon, good morning, or just hello, um, depending from where you are watching in the world, to our fourth episode of Safari Planning. Welcome and thank you so much for tuning in again. Um, I am Katja, CEO of Genman African Safaris, and I'm excited to, um, yeah, to welcome you and also thank you for your support during um, this lockdown period of the world. Um, and now that we slowly are coming back out or some of you guys back into, into lockdown. Um, so safari planning is a, uh, is episodes is a concept that we started at the beginning of lockdown to showcase you um, the most beautiful areas that uh, we are passionate about um, traveling to, um, to Africa and showing our guests in, in a responsible manner of how to travel Africa, making, um, making the right impact. And um, we've had sessions that included self-driving through Namibia, um, Botswana sensations, as well as um, Tanzania. So for the people who've watched our last sessions, they know that we are always um, having something to win and announcing a winner. So today I'm really excited to announce the winner of our last episode, which was um, all on Tanzania. And um, the lucky winner is um, going to be able to go for with two people on a six day safari um, through Tanzania with um, all meals included, all transport included, um, national. I don't know why. Sorry, someone muted my mic by accident. <laughs> But um, so sorry, but anyway, I haven't announced the winner yet. So the winner of these of the six day um, Tanzania safari, which is in conjunction with African Tulip, Karacha Simba Lodge, Kisaru Serengeti Camp and Lamara and Gorongoro Tented Camp, taking you to um, Lake Man Manyara National Park, known for tree climbing lines, Serengeti National Park, as well as in Gorongoro Crater is Tammy Nortier. So Tammy, if you're watching, please leave us a comment. If you're not watching, we will celebrate you in any case. And uh, one of our team members, uh, most likely Chris or Kim, will be in touch with you um, to give you the voucher for this incredible um, for this incredible prize. And thank you for entering. Um, and uh, well done to be this lucky winner. And um, I hope to uh, welcome you in Tanzania soon, um, as soon as you can travel there. So today we've changed concepts um, a little bit. And um, as the world is opening, um, is opening for travel and people are getting ready for the vaccinations, there's rapid testing of COVID going on and people are slowly starting to book their holidays again. Um, we've changed our rhythm a little bit and are going to present you once in a lifetime opportunities to actually come and travel. Um, so we've created these uh, beautiful itineraries with wonderful guides um, that are going to, that we're going to bring to you at um, really wonderful, um, wonderful um, rates and prices. Um, and um, today we start with walking wild in mana pools and wangi and so i'm taking you today together with steve bolnick and um, garth jenman steve bolnick one it's a recognized um safari guide and um, garth jenman um owner of hideaways i'm going to take you to mana pools and um and to Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe. One, Zimbabwe, definitely one of my uh, most favorite um, safari destinations. And um, yeah, Chris, if you can pop in um, Steve and Garth, I would uh, love to introduce them. Steve is, as I mentioned, is recognized as uh, one of Southern Africa's most outstanding guides. He grew up uh, with a deep, deep love for Africa and has spent the past 29 years living and guiding in Southern Africa. And um, he has tra um, trained aspiring guides in Southern Africa and Botswana and Zimbabwe and has led research safaris even for WWF um, and Washington uh, University. And uh, between guiding, I don't know how you've done that, Steve, really. I would love to know more about that. Between gu guiding, also acquired three 
university degrees in related subjects. And Steve, you are the only licensed guy to operate professionally in South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe. I'm not too sure if that's true. We will figure that out. Your passion, Steve, is, um, is for walking safaris, so safaris on foot in, in big game country. And we will definitely also talk just now about um, your love for conservation and what you believe, how you believe tourism is a driver for conservation, um, which obviously speaks into the values of, of Jane Min and why we've chosen you today. And before I say hello to Steve, just a quick intro also for um, Garth, Garth Jane Min. He is the um, owner of, um, of Hideaways, um, got into the tourism industry in 93 um, and also started his career in tourism actually in um, Zimbabwe and has since then been and uh, it's a successful entrepreneur um, leading businesses with more than 150 um, staff and employees, um, sending travelers all over Southern Africa, East Africa, Madagascar, and hideaways, um, runs and manages lodges in uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, as well as, um, as Mozambique. So that was a long introduction. Um, hello, Steve. Hello, Garth. It's lovely to have you here today. Hi, thank you. Um, Steve, I'm going to dive right in. Are you really, is this, is this correct here, the only guide licensed to operate professionally in South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe? No, that must be corrected. I think at the time that came out of the archives, I probably was, and I since let, um, allowed my guide's license in Botswana to lapse because I wasn't guiding there often enough to justify uh, the cost. But I cut my teeth as a guide way back in Botswana and uh, that was the first guide's license I held um, and then really wanted to do, pursue a career in guiding and of course the standards in Zimbabwe are something to aspire to so I, I uh, took my Zimbabwean professional guide's license and then uh, found myself spending a lot of time in South Africa so I took my South African guide's license as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. But I no longer have a Botswana guides license. I do guide periodically in Botswana in conjunction with licensed Botswana guides. All right. So today we're not talking Botswana. Today we're talking Zimbabwe. And um, Steve, tell us about um, how did you become a guide and what sort of guiding do you do um, today? What inspired you to become a guide and what do you love most about your profession? And uh, then once you've answered that, Garth, I also would love to talk a little bit to you about um, you started in the industry as a, as a safari guide and to hear what did you love most about it and um, when you started it. So Steve, take us to your the beginning of your journey as a safari guide. Well, it, it was actually accidental. Um, I'd always wanted to go to the Okavango and never dreamed that I would get there. Um, but I had this crazy dream that I wanted to become a truck driver, extra heavy duty truck driver. And so after I finished, uh, my parents were outraged that that was my dream in life. Um, but after I got my second university degree, I said, that's it. I've got two university degrees. I'm going to get a truck driver's license now. <laughs> and um, I spent a few weeks transporting steel from in steel factories in the Gauteng area. And it didn't take me long to realize that it was not a very romantic lifestyle. I lived in a two-man tent in a caravan next to a steel factory. Anyway, so I... I stopped truck driving, but now I had this license to drive big, heavy vehicles and I needed some money. And a friend of mine had said that driving the big tour buses in South Africa was a, a good way for a young student to, to earn some money. So I applied in those days pre-email. So I sent out letters with CVs and I got a reply from a, a company that asked me to come for an interview. And I, I must be honest, I, I was very naive. I didn't do any due diligence. I thought they were a big bus tour company. And they called me up afterwards and said, how would you like to go to the Okavango in two days' time? And I said, oh, I'd love to, but I didn't know you could get there in a bus. And they said, actually, no, we run overland safaris. And two days later, I was on my way up to the Okavango and fell madly in love with with the Okavango and safari life. And... Um, so I decided to be a guide until I grew up and um, I'm still, you know, I still have that aspiration. One day I'll grow up and 
to come along. <laughs> uh, Garth, tell us about your life as a guide. And uh, I believe you also started, um, or you started guiding in Zimbabwe, not so much in, in Botswana. What, um, what was it like? Well, I also fell into it. Um, I, was, I was actually uh, um, up in Zim and I was, I was trading in curios and hand knitted uh, woolen uh, jerseys with African patterns on. And I always would stay at, at this backpackers called Copy Lodge on Copy Road. So people from Zim all know Copy Road, it's quite famous. And, um, and, and so I used to stay and I got, I got friendly with the owner, a chap called Callum McIntyre. And Callum was running these trips to minor pools. And um, we, I, so I would come and go and, and we got really good friends. And then he, he actually approached me and he said, listen, Garth, um, uh, he was a bit older than me and he had three kids. I was just a youngster, you know, um, enjoying myself. And he said, uh, I, he can't run these trips to minor pools anymore. He, he needs to go back to accounting because uh, pay the bills for his, his, his uh, three kids. I don't know if that was a warning that there, there isn't enough money in, in, in tourism or guiding, but anyway. Um, so I took that on, and I mean, I, and I, I was really raw. I didn't, I didn't know what, you know. I, I think I learned how to how to how to steam rice then, you know. So, and um, and I ran these trips to minor pools. Um, and it was very popular. Every Monday, I would leave Arari, uh, I'd stop off at Chinoy Caves um, for lunch, um, and then head up to the main uh, parks office on the escarpment. And and actually, we would, camp, you know, I don't see if you know that dam behind. Um, Behind the box camp, yeah. yeah. So we would camp there at night, and and there would be a, an old guy with an old FN um, who, who would protect us from the wildlife and whatever else. Um, there was no lights and just a very basic uh, ablution block there. Um, and uh, then I'd, then on on the Tuesday morning we would head down into um, into Mana, and uh, and then we would come out on the Friday and head all the way back to Harare. And it was just spectacular. I mean, minor pool still to, to this day, to me, is just the best park around. It's, it's truly wild. You're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, back then, I'm trying to think, there were three rules um, that you, you weren't allowed to do. You, were, you weren't allowed to collect firewood. Um, you weren't allowed to, to sit on the top of a vehicle. But it was funny, you could you could walk up to a lion and pat it on his head, but you couldn't sit on top of a vehicle and you would get a fine for that. And the third, I'm trying to think of the third, it'll come to me, the, the third rule. So yeah, so that's how I got into 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 tourism. And and I and I and I really like in the winter months, um that's when mana is just ideal, you know. The the the, the different pools left over from the, the Zambezi, it just draws in the wildlife. And it's just phenomenal. It's uh, you know, anyone, if you're coming to Africa, you want to go on a walking safari, you must do model. So we're going to explore a little bit what does it mean to uh, go on a walking safari and then also what does it mean to be led um, by um, by a private guide on all of this, on this entire trip. But before we do so, I want to quickly um, touch on the uh, COVID regulations just because it is um, so apt for Zimbabwe. So um, just for anyone who's considering planning a trip to Zimbabwe, um, that uh, please know you need to arrive in the country with a negative um, PCR test that is not older than, than 72 hours at the time of departure um, from your destination. And um, however, then at the same time, if you do require a COVID test um, for your um, for your destination for your travels post um, post a visit to Zimbabwe, there are testing facilities um, all across the country, and especially in Vic Falls and Harare, of course. And um, test results are given. Um, with a two to five hours um, test cost between fifty and seventy dollars. So Zimbabwe, um, so in Zimbabwe, we definitely can can cater for all of this. So there is stands therefore nothing stands in your way of actually either coming to Zimbabwe or, or planning your trip to Zim. Um, and this trip that we are presenting is called Walking Wild. Um, and uh, walking wild in Mana and Wangi. And Steve, um, you in particular said also, in your, as I suggested in your intro, that you love um, doing safari in big game country on foot. Um, tell us why. Tell me more about it. Tell the audience more about it. 
Well, it's, it's a passion of mine, and I, I always say to people, I'd rather see an Impala on foot than a lion from a vehicle. It just feels completely different. And I think people often ask, why, why would you want to walk when you can drive? Um, and they're two completely different experiences. You know, obviously the one reason people give regularly is that you see the smaller things in the bush. You see the tracks and the insects, um, the things the dung, the things you'll miss when you're driving. And of course, you can get to places on foot that you can't get to by vehicle. There's, there's no limit in, in many parks in Zimbabwe regarding where you can get to. So you can get to very remote, special places that, that nobody else can get to unless, they, unless they're on foot. Um, I must say that in most places, you're more likely to see game very close up from a vehicle than on foot. That's not always true in, in Mana. Um, but that, that isn't the main attraction. Um, it's so much more of an intimate experience with the bush. It's so visceral. Um, your senses come alive. It's, um, you know, it's, it's the difference between being an observer and being a participant. Instead of rushing around seeking the spectacular, you're just there absorbing the miraculous. And the, the, the experience is just completely different. Um, and something else that I believe very strongly and I've observed over my many years of guiding, you know, it's pretty much accepted that humanity evolved in Africa. And for millions of years, until fairly recently, 12,000 years ago, our predecessors were all hunter-gatherers. And so we have this enormous genetic information that has adapted us for a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And it's only recently that we've had to adapt to navigating malls and freeways and cell phones. And so we have a genetic memory, and I see it time and again. People come on safari, and on day one on a walking safari, they are petrified. And it takes a remarkably short period of time before they feel like they've come home and they just slip in to being on, on, a, on foot safari. You see it as well in, on a, a, a driving safari, but it's so much more apparent um, on a foot safari. And if I can I give you a quick anecdote? I, I, many years ago, I did a four day backpacking safari in a really, really wild area in Zimbabwe. And I had a, a very successful a gentleman from the financial sector who had never been to Africa before. And somehow other friend of his conned him into doing this five or four day backpacking safari. And one of the things we have to be careful of as guides is what we accept as the normal is extraordinary for our guests. And we always need to take that into account. And I think it was on the second or third day of the trip, we'd been sleeping out in the open. We ended up on the top of a copy with elephants walking down below us and everybody just settled into their own thoughts. And this guy came up to me and apologized for interfering in my reverie. And he said, Steve, I just need to tell you that you've taken me so far out of my comfort zone that I have absolutely no reference points left. But he was telling me this with this huge smile, like a, a little kid <laughs> at a candy store. And he said, this trip has completely changed my life and the way I see the world. And that's exactly what I'm referring to, is that, that sudden coming home, coming back to where we all began. Um, so does that help explain the difference? Uh, <laughs> I think it does. And I see from the comments from our audience that, um, that, most, that a lot of people agree with you, that walking, um, walking on foot in the bush is the best. And I do love the comment that you made. It's like walking safaris, you know, seeing the spectacular, feeling the miraculous. I know Kim, our copywriter in the background, will be loving this, um, this sentence. And uh, Steve, let's um, dive straight into... Um, um, straight into the itinerary that you've um, put together um, for us and where you will take our guests to. 
And um, so take us a bit through a, a brief overview of the itinerary. I believe it's uh, Mana Pools and Wangi National Park and then Victoria Falls. And um, then I would love to talk more about um, with you and Garth about Mana and then off to Wangi. Great. Um, so I'll keep it brief because I'm sure Garth wants to mention a few things and you too, Katya. Uh, I should quickly mention now that I spent many years running walking safaris in mainly in Wangi. Um, so it's kind of like my second home. I lived in Victoria Falls for many years. But the, the way we designed the trip, we, we start in Mana Pools, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little more about Mana. It's just the most exquisite destination in a country that is full of beautiful, extraordinary places. And Garth mentioned that already. Um, so we'll do a few days of walking out of Camp Mana, which is the camp that I run in, in Mana Pools. Very, very special place uh, with a very strong commitment to environmental sensitivity. It's a very comfortable but minimalist camp, and the focus is on experiencing the bush, not on the cocktails. But we'll mix cocktails for you as well. <laughs> well, well. Hope so. are, you, are you? Are you at Camp Mana at the moment? That that view behind you is that that's from the camp, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Garth, don't put me on the spot. I wish I were there right now. <laughs> and, and then, of course, uh, we're going to fly across the country uh, to the northern section of Wangi, a very, very special part of Wangi National Park. And we're going to go to the Highways Camp at Nantwich. And I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about the difference between Mana Pools and Wangi and why they're both so special, because they are both incredibly special places. And no trip to Zimbabwe is complete without visiting Moziatunia, the smoke that thunders. Um, and so then we're going to head up to, to, to Victoria Falls. So I'll leave it there and, and let Garth correct me. <laughs> I don't think there's any corrections in, um, required. But Steve, take us straight into Mana Pools. What can guests expect um, walking with you at Mana Pools? What makes Mana Pools so special? And tell us some anecdotes of what's, um, what's, in, what's been the most inspiring moment for you in Mana Pools. Wow. Um, so Mana Pools, for those who, a lot of people have heard of Mana because it's, it's such a, it's become so well known. And you heard the passion when Garth was talking about it. Mana Pools is pretty unique. It's, um, it's part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site that was declared as such because of the enormous concentrations of wildlife that congregate down on the shoreline during the dry season. Um, it's... It's also very well known amongst photographers, A, because you have the freedom to move on foot. That's another advantage of being on foot. You really can move and, and, and get a good angle for a photograph if you're a wildlife photographer. But it's also famous amongst wildlife photographers for the famous blue light. And you can see in that photograph the, 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 blue, the famous blue light of Mana Pools. I would say... There's so many things that make Mana famous, but if you ask people, they'll talk about the alberta trees, Fiderbia alberta, um, and the forests of alberta trees, which are, the trees are not unique, but the forests are something extraordinary. And um, of course, it's famous also for its lion population, its beautiful elephants with a couple of very big tuskers, some very, very relaxed. <laughs> big elephant bulls, and, of course, the painted dogs. Uh, you can't talk about Mana without talking about the painted dogs. So it's, as you can see, if you choose the areas carefully, it's a walking safari paradise. You have very good visibility, a lot of open country with enough cover to do approaches. But the, the wildlife in Mana seems to have studied out of a different rule book. The, the, the animals there are just so much more relaxed than anywhere else. Yeah. I've been. Um, so chilled. Eh? Yeah. You know, you have to obviously always bear in mind that you're in a wilderness area and you can't become complacent. But in general, the wildlife doesn't scatter like it does in other places. And that's why I said earlier, when you're on 
foot, you don't normally get that close to animals or don't even necessarily see many animals. Whereas mm -hmm. in Mana, it's impossible to go on a walk without seeing animals. So Garth, um, when have you last been to Mana Pools and when is your next trip planning to go to Mana Pools? Um, 2009 actually was the last time. And, and I had the strangest experience, um, Steve, that I don't think anyone else has had in Mana. Um, I'll, I'll, I won't take up too much of everyone's time um, because it's, it's, it's not something that um, your clients or our clients are going to see in Mana. But uh, it was late afternoon and we were driving up the back of Mana um, by Chine Pools and it was dusk. And uh, the next thing, the Impalas came through like crazy. And so we knew something was after them and it was the, it was the painted dogs and they came through. And I was on the Land Cruiser videoing. I was trying to get video footage. And my friend Wayne was, was driving the vehicle. And we came around the corner. It was right at dusk. And there was a person standing in the, in the Jeep tracks with no clothes on. Um, <laughs> it's got to be the strangest experience out. I mean, I, I actually just dropped the video. I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne got out of the vehicle, and now the vehicle's running, okay? And he went up to the guy, so he goes up to the guy, and the, and the chap ducks around the back of the vehicle, jumps inside the driver's seat. Now the vehicle's running, you know? So I reach over, over the back of this chap, and I pull out the, the keys of the ignition, because, you know, I, I don't want to leave Wayne in the middle of, of the bush. And uh, we managed to get him out of the vehicle. We, we tried chatting to him in English and Shauna, he just didn't, he was quite glazed over. I said to Wayne, right, let's put him next to me and, uh, and, and let's take him to the warden's, uh, the warden's house uh, to fight because we, we couldn't work out. And I, I actually offered him some biscuits, which he grabbed from me and threw straight out, out the vehicle. Then I offered him some water and I could see by his, the movement of his arm that, that my, um, um, Container, water container was also going to go out the window, so I pulled it back. And we got to the warden's uh, uh, house. It was dark. Uh, and we still didn't know where this chap had come from. Um, we actually had to help him in, and the warden put him, couldn't talk to him either. No one could. And he put him in a room for the night, locked the door for his own safety. And, uh, yeah, we headed off back to our camp, and then we, we came back the next day to find out, well, like, where, does, where did this chap come from, and how did he survive in the bush? And basically, at the airstrip, three days before, a crew had come in to, to drill a new borehole. He had taken his clothes off and run off into the bush. So that's where he came from. But what I was amazed by is he survived in that bush for at least two nights. And no one ate him. Yeah. So <laughs> that was fine. <laughs> to the audience, this is not something that they will go, are yes. going to experience when coming I, I to I can assure camp. all of you out there that you won't experience that. Steve, I don't think you've seen someone walking around uh, in their, in their um, birthday suits in, in Mount Pools. No, I, certainly not that dramatic and not uh, naked, but in Wangi, I ran into some people on foot who had been lost um, for a while. But Katya, you know, it's so difficult to say why Mana, you asked me why Mana is so special. Yeah. I spoke about some of it. But of course, I, I, I can't not mention the views across the Zambezi River and onto the Zambezi Escarpment. They're just mind boggling. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do any more branding uh, for Mana Pools. It's it's branded itself. Um, I guess, um, Steve, I totally agree with you. I think the, the, the sunsets that I've watched um, at Mana Pools overlooking um, the river and then the, the, the Rift Valley and the escarpments are one of the most magnificent sunsets that I've ever seen. And everyone knows that sunset in, Af sunset in Africa are in, generally, in general magnificent. But the, uh, um, the open space, wide spaces um, that you feel when you look at that water and at that escarpment is um, it's really a sense of magnificence on the one, on the one side, but then and then on the other side, you feel relatively small because you're just this little dot on the, on the side of the river. 
Um, so I agree. And um, Steve, you said something earlier. So you um, own Camp Mana, which is obviously where guests will spend the first four nights on this trip. Um, and thank you for being so generous. And um, basically, when we put the trip together, we um, guests only pay for three nights and stay for four. Thank you. Um, and um, tell us a bit more about the camp you mentioned earlier. It's um, it's all about being close to nature, being very eco-conscious. And uh, I also mentioned earlier your in, um, your involvement in, in conservation and you knowing or you believing in that tourism is a driver for conservation. So tell us a bit more about your camp. So Katya, when we put the camp together, um, I was determined to try and find that fine balance between comfort and being environmentally sensitive and not alienating the guests from the experience. I didn't want to enter the arms race and get a broad bath for every room and aircon. And I, I just felt that often those accoutrements distract people, but I still want people to be very comfortable. So, I mean, I could go on about the little features that I think make the camp exceptionally comfortable, but that's that's not a priority. Just suffice it to say the camp is very, very comfortable. Um, some might even say luxurious. Some might say just being in the bush is a luxury. But it's a tented camp. It's old school. It has uh, flush toilets and running water, but it's old school. Everything has to be filled by hand. Um, we heat the water before we put it in the showers. Uh, it's very, very romantic, I think. Um, and and the emphasis is on having a real bush experience. You know, there's a there's a safari camp for absolutely everybody, and and the, we seem to have attracted the right kind of people for our camp because people have absolutely loved that sense of remoteness, simplicity, but immersion in the bush experience. So we don't insist that people do walks, but we strongly encourage people to walk. And I think almost everybody who's been at the camp has done at least one walk. Some people only walk, they never ever get in a vehicle, or sometimes we'll drive somewhere to look for tracks or to look for something interesting and then leave the vehicle and walk from the vehicle. So the, the emphasis really is on walking. We do offer canoeing as well, which is a fantastic way to see minor pools. Um, and, and Steve, tell me, I mean, in my day, uh, a big highlight, I mean, there's so many highlights. I mean, the night activity at your own camp with, the, the, you know, with the different wildlife hyenas and whatnot um, cruising around. But during the daytime, is phenomenal at minor pools when you're sitting at the camp. I mean, you know, you're talking about like armchair safaris. I mean, I can imagine at Camp Mana, I haven't been there yet, but I can imagine that's a massive highlight because you'll just have the, the wildlife continuously coming through the camp. Absolutely, Garth. I encourage guests who are there for more than two or three days to spend at least one half of a day or a whole day just staying in camp. Read a book. We have a spotting scope available. We have binoculars available. But you know, the location of, you know, Mana Pools is incredible, but our camp location is like the Discovery Channel on steroids. I have never looked out from the dining room and not seen a minimum of four mammal species. And I recall last season sticking my head out the dining area and counting nine different mammal species in front of the the camp, but that's that's ridiculous. That's without even yeah, leaving. Yeah, 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 and of totally. course, you know, it all it happens to everybody, but I can't tell you how many times you've been out on a game drive with guests who are desperate to see the dogs, and we get back and the staff say, Where have you guys been? The dogs just came through the camp. <laughs> <laughs> By then it's too dark to see them or to, to follow them. Um but the game viewing from the camp is special and we have elephants coming through camp every single day and we have some lions that live in the area and they, they're very special lions they've come to accept us you know as i said earlier you can't be complacent but they come through the camp at least once or twice a week um and we've had them come past while we've been sitting eating well we once had them eating a buffalo outside the dining room and you know the joke was there wasn't enough space on the table for the buffalo so they had to eat outside <laughs> 
Um, but we've had them walk right literally through the middle of the camp uh, during dinner and, and past the dining room. And they seem to have just accepted us. They've never shown any aggression. And even on foot, I'm very sensitive uh, to not disturbing the animals. I don't think that's my role. Um, and I think these lions have come to recognize me because I've seen other guides approach them elsewhere. And the young, there's a male who's a little bit jumpy. He's run away, even though the guides weren't that close. And he's come and lay next to my tent, even though I'm coming in and out of my tent. He seems to know that I'm not going to, to harass him. So, I mean, that is very special. The, 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 the visits from the elephants, the lions, uh, the leopards. I had to go and do a, a supply run and I came back and I, I said to the staff, is any news about the lions? And they said, no, nobody has seen the lions at all for days. I said, wow, that's a bit of a problem. And I had to go and check on one of the tents and I went to the tent and there were fresh tracks there where a lion had lay outside the tent. So I thought, well, I've got to go and tell the staff. This was like from the night before and this was a 6 a.m. meeting. So I thought, well, let me just go through the dining area. And um, a lion had walked through the river and walked through the dining room with muddy paws. So um, there were lion tracks straight through the dining room. So I went to the staff and said, so you guys, you, no sign of the lions. I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Steve, it looks like we're getting nudged on to Nantwich. Um, I am nudging you on to Nantwich. Yes. But before so, we go there, before we go there, there guys, <laughs> Steve, you know, there's, there's always those iconic shots in, in, in minor pools um, with the elephants um, on their hind legs. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's only in minor pools that the elephants do that. No, it's the only place I've seen it, and minor pools is yeah. well known. But I actually also wondered about that, and I once put a post up and asked the general public, and somebody said they'd seen an elephant in Kruger doing that. Okay. Um, but it's a handful of elephants in, in Mano who, who've learned to do that. And um, Katya, I promise, we're going to Nantwich right now. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. So, and But we are we, you're not taking clients walking to Nantwich, even though this is a, um, this is a walking safari. You mentioned earlier we are flying. And um, on, a, on a chartered aircraft, on a private uh, little aircraft, and um, you are, unfortunately, we don't have images um, of this right now, but you're flying over Lake Kariba, which is pretty phenomenal, flying over this massive, massive, um, obviously artificial um, lake. And uh, it really, especially at the right time of the day, it feels like you are um, flying over the ocean in that dark, dark blue water glistening um, underneath you is, um, is a sight and a highlight itself I find um, on this itinerary. So I, I would be immensely excited for that flight. I've only done it once and um, it was phenomenal. And I've also driven around Kariba once and definitely the flight would be uh, <laughs> <That's> uh, <laughs> <laughs> travel. Uh, with the right company, of course, that is. Okay, so um, Steve, are you taking us to Wangi National Park? Um, tell us from a guiding perspective and from a customer experience or from a safari guide, walking safari guide perspective, not as wangy compared to Mana and why is it such a beautiful fit to combine both? Wow. Straight off the bat, ecologically, they're completely different. Um, and I, I do have a soft spot for the Nantwich area. I mean, I do, I still do a lot of guiding in Wangi and I guide in the in the south around main camp and as well as up around cinematella and robbins and nantwich area um, and all of it is beautiful it has this incredible diversity of vegetation ecotypes and and wildlife and bird life um, but nantwich sits in an area that is particularly diverse you know you have the grasslands there you have some miombo woodland there's um, the granite copies, you've got the uh, Mapani, you've got the Karus, the Kalahari Sands. Um, and it's, it's just incredibly special. 
and you get some species close by that are easily accessible. You know, you don't really see many roan antelope elsewhere in, in Rangi. Maybe down round main camp towards Ngrefla, that area, if you're lucky. But um, going west of, of uh, Nantwich uh, is the best roan antelope sightings I've ever had. And, of course, the Matetsi area right near there is famous for the sable antelope. And I've had the best cheetah sightings on foot ever, uh, just between Nantwich and Robbins. Um, so it's it's a very special place. But I, I want to mention something that I think a lot of people overlook. People always talk about how Wangi is so special because it's the largest national park in Zimbabwe. And I want to add to that. You know, Wangi, I think, said about 15,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of East Timor. But what people overlook is that if you go north, you have the Kazuma Pans, you've got the Matetsi right up to the Zambezi. If you go west, you've got the Sibuyu Forest in Botswana, you've got the Kazuma Forests, you've got the Makalela Forests, and then you hit the southern section of Chobi. You go north of there, you've got Savuti, um, uh, Linyanti, and you go west of that, you're into the Okavango. And you go a little bit south, you're in the Maharikari, and it's all continuous. Of course, it's under threat from population growth. But if my estimates are correct, you're now looking at a wilderness area the size of the country of Lithuania, if you put all of that together. Now, if you add in the central Kalahari, which is connected as well, and the Kalahari Transfrontier Park, you have this, this wilderness area with completely different ecosystems the size of Greece, maybe bigger, I'm sure, bigger than Greece. That, that's that's mind-boggling that at this time in history, we still have an almost intact wilderness area. And even though there are species that are found in one part of that, that that are not found in other areas, you know, you've got Kemsbok, you've got Springbok, and you've got Lechui and Puku and Sitatunga that, that don't are not found all over, but you've got this amazing ecosystem that we really need to protect somehow. And bang in the middle is Nantwich. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's say it for Nantwich. It's, <laughs> it's a very special. <laughs> um, Garth, tell us, um, tell us about um, Nantwich and why it's special for you and tell us about the lodge. Um, so, the, so Nantwich Lodge, I mean, we actually only, from Vic Falls Airport to Nantwich, we're only an hour's drive. It's um, 50 kilometers on tar and, and 50 kilometers on good gravel road. And Nantwich is, is, is actually perched above a, a, a really big dam in, in Wangi. Um, and our chalets are, are around the, the, the edges of this dam looking down. But we, we also look over this massive big plain. And we, when Steve spoke about the, the best sighting of cheetah he's ever seen on those plains, um, so we've we've had incredible sightings there. I mean, the the, the buffalo that come in there, we can have a buffalo herds eight hundred, a thousand strong, um, and and then obviously with buffalo lions are following. So the, the open areas and and one thing about uh, Wangi National Park, uh, most of Wangi National Park doesn't have natural water, so a lot of it's pumped. But where we are, we've got all these springs. So when you go for a walk. Um, like out in the plain, we've got these palm trees by, by one of the springs. And on that same walk, you'll, you'll walk past another two springs in these massive open plains. So it's it's truly a phenomenal um, experience. Um, you, know, you can see on that one picture with the swimming pool. So in the distance over there, you can see the big green grasslands there. So that's just a, a great place to, to actually walk and, and see the game. And the, and the diversity, as I mean, Steve's already spoken about. You, you, you're liable to see roan and sable, um, wild dog coming through there as well um, while you're walking. So it's just, it's always the highlight for me. I mean, I could actually remember literally every walk I've probably ever done in, in the African bush. You know, as, as opposed to game drives, they can blur um, into one after a while. You know? But, but a walk is so different. Every single time you go for a walk, your experience is so, so different. Whether it is seeing a lot of game and, and diversity of game or the small things and the tracks and everything. And of course, your guide is so critical. And having Steve uh, run these trips between Camp Mana and Nantwich is, is, is 
worth its, its weight in gold as it, you know the, the, the that, that's what anyone who's ever done a walking safari, you can pick it up. You've got to have a really good guide. Um, and Steve certainly got, I know he's still trying to grow up in that, but he's, he's certainly packed in a, a lot of things in his life and he has an incredible amount of experience in the bushes of Norway. So, um, Garth, tell us a little bit more about Nantwich Lodge itself. How big is it um, and what's the setup um, of, the, of the lodge? So Nantwich is a, um, a, a it's a brick and mortar lodge with uh, thatch roofs. It it was an old uh, parks um, lodge years ago. Um, I came across it from um, um, a writer called Tony Park, who's actually a, a, a part shareholder in Nantwich as well, and he's an Australian writer who who has done. I think Tony was telling me he's done over twenty um, game counts. Um, every year at, at, at uh, Wangi. He's only missed it twice. Once he was in Afghanistan, so we can excuse him. And this time he's stuck in Australia, so he couldn't get out to uh, <laughs> come on, on the game count. But he told me about, so we've, we've actually got another lodge called Elephant's Eye close to main camp. But even prior to us getting that lodge, I was speaking to Tony in Sydney once about where's a good place for, for um having a, a lodge in Wangi, and he told me about this spot, but he said, God, he'll never get it because it's a park's place. But literally, he said he, he wrote three of his novels from um, one of the chalets there, and he didn't need to go for a walk or a drive. He, he saw so many um, uh, cat kills, actually, uh, in front of the, um, in front of the, the chalet and, and the dam there. And uh, yeah, years later, we, we had came across this opportunity. I'd forgotten about the name he had told me, Nantwich, but remembered the area. And then I asked him about it, and he fell over backwards. He said, God, that this, this is the best place for wildlife and, and walks in, in the park. And uh, he said, listen, he, he wants to be in on this. So, you know, I mean, Tony plans to, to, to have his ashes um, um, sprinkled at, at Nantwich one day when he moves on to the next world. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's it's it truly is a phenomenal place. So we've renovated uh, uh, chalets there, and we've uh, we've used a lot. Like in this imagery, you can see the 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 shower there. That those are actually the old windows from the previous mansion. So we tried to reuse a lot of 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 what was there in the past, and of course make sure that it's it's nice and comfortable for our guests. So we've got um, nine uh, um, rooms there. Um, we've got two uh, family units and we've got a honeymoon unit. And then without the main area is, is um, right down lower, down by the dam. And, I, and the actual um, chalets are up along the ridge. So we, we've kept it nice and small. You know, we'll only ever have 18 guests there um, and nice and intimate. We, have, we only opened last year, just before. And then this year uh, would have been our second season. But we have started getting guests or, already. Um, on the weekends, we've been getting a lot of um, uh, local Zimbabweans, but now that the borders are all open, um, the bookings are starting to come back in again. Hmm. So after guests have spent um, four nights in um, in Wangi National Park, so the itinerary is four nights um, in um, Manapur's four nights Wangi National Park, then we move on to um, Victoria Falls and. Um, I'm just going to give a, a personal shout out to Alala Lodge, if I may, um, in this platform. I know there's many beautiful properties um, in Victoria Falls and, um, and you know, everyone, every lodge has their charm. But I actually want to give a small little shout out to the staff and the management at Alala Lodge that have um, personally treated me and a lot of um, our staff over the years. And of course, our guests so generously, uh, with so much generosity. Um, that um, I just want to give them a quick shout out. Um, we have an office in Victoria Falls that makes me, that means I travel there probably once um, once a month um, for a couple of days, generally, um, and place some- You've got your own room there, I gotcha. Yeah, room 69 is mine. <laughs> 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 ah, 69 or 72 generally. Yeah, so, yeah. quick shout out and thank you for the generosity over the years. We hope that with giving you a bit of publicity, um, this is being repaid. And obviously, we have given you numerous of happy, happy customers um, over the years. So, um, Steve, from a private guide perspective um, or from a guiding perspective, tell us um, quickly about Victoria Falls. Why shouldn't it be missed? Um, 
And yeah, what's maybe what's been your most amazing experience in Victoria Falls? Um, all right, quick, quick, but I, I'm going to be naughty. I'm going to backtrack slightly and just point out something else special about Nantwich, and that's the history. Um, you know, there were two neighbours there, H.G. Robbins at Robbins Camp, and I think it was P.D. Crew. And uh, P.D. Crew is actually buried right next to your lodge, and yes. they both played a, a pivotal role in the frontiers day. So I'm not going to go into details now, but there's that whole cultural historical side. Okay, fast forward, Vic Falls. Probably the greatest experience I had in Vic Falls was raising my twin boys and and uh, having my oldest son come and live there. Um, so it really is where my kids started out life. Um, but Victoria Falls is facing a lot of challenges with the burgeoning population. Uh, I think when I first went to Victoria Falls, the population was 6,000 people, and it's now probably around 70,000 people. Um, and it's built right in the middle of a national park. And so there's a lot of pressure um, and a lot of human, I wouldn't say there's human wildlife conflict, but there's impact that humans have on the on the environment. And I'm optimistic that those challenges will be faced properly, um, but it does make it a unique uh, a, a town was well, just gotten city status. I think it's about to get city status. A unique city in the world in that it's completely surrounded by wilderness. And so you regularly have elephants walking down the main road at night. Um, and when you go or fishing, during the day, yeah. Or during the day. Yeah. And my oldest son um, has horrible memories of going fishing with me and then us encountering elephants. And I just want to just stop and watch the elephants. And I'd always have this little voice go, so does that mean we're not gonna go fishing because we've seen these bloody elephants? <laughs> so, I mean, that's so special. Where else in the world can you, you know, have that kind of opportunity to have wilderness all around you in one of the most beautiful, if you've never been to Victoria Falls, it's impossible to describe, but there's a reason why it's been considered one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and there's so much. Can I just interrupt you for a second? I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to, but I just wanted to um, quickly um, see, if I haven't responded well to a question earlier from um, Phil who asks, um, you know, what's the, what's the best, um, best length of a safari trip? And then now the second question he's asking um, on this trip that we've put together, is there, um, is there much downtime? And uh, the second question, Steve, I would like you to respond to, but the first one, um, Phil, I guess, you know, what's the perfect um, length of a safari trip? That totally depends on the destination um, you're traveling to and how much you want to see. So um, I, from a sales perspective or from a passionate um, Africa person perspective, I said there you can never stay long enough on safari. <laughs> like, so come and plan your trip for 30 days uh, if you can. Um, but what I can say is try not to cram in too much um, and try and avoid um, staying two nights here, two nights there, two nights there. If you, the, the more time you can spend at a particular highlight at a particular national park, the more involved you get with the team on the ground, the more you get to know the actual nature and surrounding, the more you immerse yourself in your actual destination and you will see a lot more than just uh, what's right in front of your eye. And Steve, maybe you can quickly answer Phil's question on um, whether there is um, a lot of down downtime on this trip that you've planned. Okay, first off, I agree with you completely. The longer you can be on safari, the better. I've been on safari for over 30 years. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> Phil, to add to what Katya has said, I would strongly encourage, even if it's your first safari, I would encourage you not to succumb to FOMO, fear of missing out. I would, because if there's a walk and a drive going, people tend to think, oh, I've got to do it because I'm here for only three or four days. Let me just grab every opportunity. But in fact, remaining behind in the camp is an opportunity because it's so quiet when everybody's gone out. And it's particularly the two camps we're talking about, you'll probably see more staying in camp and you'll have a fantastic time to relax, read a book, Tony Park's book, I assume. And, um, and, and you can pace yourself. I think the secret is to have self-discipline and not go out 
and not be tempted to think that you're going to miss something by going out. You rather have to think, well, the people who are going out on a walk or a drive are going to miss staying in camp. And then you can have a downtime as, as you want. I think you have to get that balance. I hope yeah. that answers the question. I think it answers his question, um, Steve, but he does comment here as well. He unfortunately can't manage to come for 30 years, so <laughs> which is all fair enough. Guys, I thank you. I need to unfortunately wrap this up. We said we're not going to be longer than 40 minutes. We are sitting at 55 minutes. Um, Garth and Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve, for putting this wonderful itinerary together. Um, and um, please, for all, for the audience, please watch this space. There will be limited seats released um, for departures that are guided um, by Steve specifically in 2021. They include a few free nights at each um, at, each, at each property, making it a, a really, really good value for money trip. And don't forget, guys, the sooner you travel now, the less crowds there are. So if you've ever had a bucket list destination or wanted to go somewhere, but we're worried about, um, you know, it's going to be too busy. It's going to be too packed. Now you're going to be at the most amazing places in the world with very, very little tourists around. Take up that opportunity. And I'm not just saying that as a salesperson. I'm also saying this as a as a passionate, passionate traveler. That's what I'm going to spend um, um, my time next year is actually traveling and exploring the places that are usually um, overrun. So please drop your email address in the comment box if you would like to have a copy of this itinerary, the copy of the opportunities and these departure days for 2021. Don't forget, we do offer free cancellation for COVID re reasons um, up to a few days before travel. So it is certainly safe to invest in travel if the money is not going to go anyway and the trip of your lifetime is awaiting. So drop your uh, email address in the comment box so we can send it um, on to you. And um, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Garth. And I hope to see you all here um, soon in, in a month's time, next month. I think next month's topic, most likely Madagascar. So um, see you soon. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Katja. Thanks, thanks a lot, for Steve. Me. Thanks, Katja. It's and I, I look forward to everyone coming. I see Zimbabwe has recently been voted the safest country in the world to travel to. So hopefully everyone's coming soon. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care.